Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. Today we're bringing you one hell of a story, my friends, or at least the first part of it. Today we are starting part one of a part two, maybe part three series about a man who really is the personification of evil. He really is. Like, to say he's one bad dude is really putting it lightly. Yup. Buckle up everyone because today's episode is gonna get really dark really, really fast. Although, I mean, at this point I feel like you guys, if you if you've listened before, or you know what to expect from us. And if by some chance this is the first time that you're actually listening to us, then hello. You picked <laughs> a hell of an episode to start on. A truly wonderful first impression of our podcast. Yep. Today we are covering Luis Garavito, a serial killer whose reign of terror throughout Colombia and Ecuador during the 1990s make him an absolute fucking nightmare of a human being. He is now known by names like El Loco and La Bestia, but before he was known by those names, he was referred to by the people who knew him, especially children, as a kind and helpful man that they referred to as Goofy, which is honestly just (laughs) horrifying in its own way. And yeah, like Goofy as in like the Disney character Goofy, like Mickey Mouse and Goofy. I am never going to look at Goofy the same way again. The victim count of this guy is what really stands out about him. And his terrible mustache. Oh, it's it's god-awful, you guys. You know what they say about a man's mustache, right? Oh, what's that? That is truly where a man holds his evil. Oh my god. Look at Dr. Phil. It's so true. Or, you know, there's several other prominent figures throughout history I can think of that had the rock the tash and were not so wholesome guys. I'm going to say the words evil mustache to all of you right now and just picture someone. I guarantee you didn't even have trouble with it. Yep, I guarantee it. Back to evil mustaches, though. Luis Garavito was found guilty in 2001 for the murders of not one, not ten, not twenty... Not even 50, you guys, Mm. but 138 young boys. And those are just the murders that he confessed to. The real number is likely substantially higher, and we will likely never know the actual number of lives that he took. It's likely that his victim count is in the 300s, and he is still being investigated in over 170 murders in 59 different Colombian towns. Some people actually believe that the victim count is closer to 400. There's probably over a million things things that make this case absolutely terrible, but one of those things is the fact that this man will be eligible for parole in 2023, so next year, despite the fact that the sentences for his crimes totaled up to 1,853 years and nine days. So if he gets out in 2023, that means that he basically will serve about a month for each child that he killed. So yeah, you guys, it's it's gonna be one of those stories this week. And don't worry, we're gonna do our absolute best to explain to you exactly how something like that would happen. But basically, his crimes were so bad that the country originally had absolutely no idea how to even quantify his sentence. How do you even sentence someone who has single-handedly killed hundreds upon hundreds of people? And not just people children. Especially considering the country had no death penalty, no life imprisonment, and a maximum sentence of 30 years. I have to say that's one of the things that shocked me because I always think of Colombia. Unfortunately, it does have that big connection to like drug cartels and all that. I would have thought for sure that would have been a country with a like a death sentence kind of situation. The, and I mean the fact that there's no life imprisonment, there's there's none of that. Like no. it's, it's basically guaranteed that if you are imprisoned, unless you die there or something like that you're you're probably gonna get out which is wild and not only was he maximum or rather not only was his maximum sentence 30 years but it got reduced somehow oh yeah oh yeah and we're gonna get into all of that later in this series and just for a little extra nightmare feel for you guys if he does get out he has full intentions of getting into politics so he can help abused children Truly fantastic. Just wonderful. Just fantastic. Excellent. Great. And this is probably a good as time of, as ever to let you all know that after the series is over, we will be doing one of our palate cleanser episodes. Those are episodes that we like to do after we've covered a bunch of really heavy things so we can all just breathe again for a moment before getting right back into the deep and dark lives of these terrible, terrible people. And with that being said, we're going to try something a little bit new for our next one. Yes. So we want to know what you guys want us to cover for the next palate cleanser episode. Let us know in the 
the comments if you're watching on YouTube or just tag us in a post on Twitter. So, so far we've covered Mothman and we've done our countdown of the creepiest five haunted dolls out there. And if you haven't checked out those episodes, you definitely should because we had a lot of fun with those. Yeah, they're some of my favorites, honestly. Me too. Sometimes it's good to kind of go back and talk about some of the more outlandish stuff for a moment, especially considering the last few episodes we've done. But don't worry, dear listeners, we haven't lost our touch or anything because after the next palette cleanser episode, we're going to be right back into the madness. But make no mistake, today is certainly not a palette cleanser. No, your palette going to get real dirty today. Yep. No, this is honestly one of those episodes that's probably going to make you feel a little sick inside. This entire story is horrific, and the fact that this man could just easily walk free again like a year from now is beyond belief. So how the hell does this happen? And what on earth could make someone capable of committing so many heinous crimes? Seriously, this guy's victim count could be in the 300s. Like, think about a room with 300 people in it. Oh my god. Like... And, and honestly, the other thing to point out, too, is this isn't one of those guys who is, like, active for their entire lives. These murders took place over the course of nine short years. This is someone who could have possibly killed 300 to 400 children in the span of nine years. Just think about that for a moment and, like, what that actually means. It's honestly really hard to fathom. Like, that is so many people. So many kids. Oh, it, it's, Yeah. This, this is going to be fun, Charlotte. This is going to be fun. Uh, so quite a few different things happened in Colombia during this time that made it a lot easier for him to do the things that he did without getting caught. So the country itself was deeply struggling, and Luis Garavito saw this and used it to his advantage in the most horrible ways possible. The city that a big chunk of his murders were committed was once called the murder capital of the world. And I want you to imagine, like, just how <laughs> bad you have to be to stand out in a place called the murder capital of the world. I mean, uh, one point, I don't know if you remember this, but a few years ago in Edmonton, because um, we had like 38 homicides in the course of a year, they called it Deadmonton, and we were all like, oh, that's so crazy. And then people in like New York and Detroit are like, eh, rookie numbers, kids. Honestly, I remember so many people hearing that and being like, really, that's it? And I'm like, no. No, that's a lot that's for real here. bad. Like, real we're, bad. We're, you know, there's a, don't get me wrong, we got a lot of problems up here, just like everybody else, but like, we're not definitely not going to be the murder capital of the world anytime soon. Don't say that. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, Colombia was in a state of unrest. In fact, the Colombian conflict was at a high during this time. Between all of that and the war on drugs happening in the country, a lot of his victims were either forgotten, never talked about, or just seen as some of the many unnamed victims of the civil unrest that were happening at the time. Throughout history, we've seen bad people taking advantage of the less fortunate during times like this. The majority of his victims were young children who lived on the streets. He would lure them with promises of money or work and then do these terrible things. He came across as a charming man who just wanted to help kids that were in need. And because a lot of these kids didn't have families or homes, the majority of the murders were not investigated until well after he was caught. It's devastating. I mean, the majority of people who lost their homes during this time were kids, and unfortunately, when there are kids at risk, they're gonna be pre pre just predators. And something that's really, really unfortunate about the victims is that a lot of them were never identified or their bodies were just never claimed. So we do have the names of some of his victims and even recollections for a few survivors, but we're honestly likely never going to know the extent of evil that he inflicted upon the country. Something that he would often do is torture and kill his victims in similar ways to the drug cartels so that it would look like they were killed by them instead. And that gives you a glimpse into the kind of person that he was and what he was willing to do to continue getting away with murder. Something really crazy about all of this is from 1969 to 1980, there was another serial killer active within the same area named Pedro Lopez, and he had a similar victim count. Jeez. Which is just unreal. Um, the only difference between the two was that Lopez only pre on girls. And he was actually called the world's worst serial killer for a while by the Guinness Book of World Records until they removed him because people complained that it was making murder into a competition. Yeah, you don't want anyone challenging that world no. record for sure. We'll probably cover him at some point too. Yeah, later, later, because honestly these guys, they suck. Yeah, truly evil beyond all belief. And one of the reasons that true crime interests me so much is that I like to know why people behave the way they do. And I try to like make sense of people's actions. But with people like this, I feel like there really is no answer. It's impossible to like 
quantify yeah. this level of evil and so it genuinely like drives me crazy oh you're so right i feel completely the same way like you look at other killers that we've covered you can kind of get a basic understanding of why they did what they did or what led them to commit terrible crimes and i mean i'm not excusing what they did but just understanding totally. it, right? yeah that's exactly it but like something like this like this is something i struggle to wrap my head around like to me this this is evil my big thing is like i i i when you go through things as a child, obviously that affects you, whether it's positive, negative, or otherwise, right? And to me, it's like, if you went through such terrible things as a kid, wouldn't you want to make sure that nobody else went through that? To me, that separates, like, a strong person from a weak person. I'm going to somehow, I'm going to find a way to bring RuPaul's Drag Race into this. <laughs> yep, that, I'm doing it. Um, on RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars, <laughs> there was a contestant named Sonic. And she said something that stuck with me and will stick with me for the rest of my life. She said, don't let that hurt child make your grown-up decisions. Totally. And that is what we see with people like this is it's a lot of people, if they've been hurt, they, they see that pain and they're like, I don't want anyone to feel the way that I did. Totally. And then there's people like him that saw hurt and they're like, well, I'm going to make everybody yeah, else I suffered now. so now I need to inflict as much damage as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, there's no question that Louise Garavito was an absolute monster who took the economic and social situation during this time to his advantage while he preyed on the weakest of society, helpless children. Without remorse, or at least that's what it really, really seemed like. But we're going to come back to that a lot later in the series. And that means we're going to talk later about a topic we know you all love, the <laughs> possibility of redemption. I think we've been uh, bringing that up a lot lately. We have, we have. And I've said it before, and I will say it again, it's possible to move on from bad things that you have done and to be a better person. But there comes to there comes a point where you can do enough bad things that you just no longer get to come back from that. Like, how can someone do what he did and then just be like, oh, yeah, I'm fine now. Let me go out into the world so I can be a politician. What a guy. And he was a smaller guy, too, which is interesting to me. Yeah, not quite Pee Wee Gaskin size, but he really wasn't far off. He did walk with a limp, and he was about five foot five. So pretty darn close. And the reason we point that out is because it would come up as a reason that he would be bullied in his earlier years. His upbringing was pretty rough even by serial killer standards. So I suppose at this point we should offer up another quick disclaimer that this is going to be a really, really, really difficult episode to listen to. Pretty, pretty tough you guys. Oh yeah, so let's do this. Let's dive on into the early life of Luis Garavito. Luis Alfredo Garavito Cubios was born on January 25th, 1957 in Genova, which is a municipality of Quindio in Colombia, to Rosa Delia Cubios and Manuel Antonio Garavito. Civil unrest would begin in the country very shortly after his birth, after the president was overthrown. Violence was a part of his life almost from the very beginning. This is definitely one of those cases where pretty much everything is bad from the moment he enters the world. I couldn't agree more. Things were pretty rough, like, right from the get-go. He was the oldest of seven kids. Louise described his mother as being someone who didn't show him a lot of affection. She had some violent tendencies, and not really a ton is known about her, but it is very likely that she was a sex worker. There are many reports that she would often abuse drugs and alcohol to escape the reality of her life and also to escape what her husband was doing to her. So his father. Oh boy. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty well known that the majority of serial killers, not all, but a big chunk of them, have histories of abuse with at least one parent, but his dad was bad by even those standards. Yes, and believe it or not, there are some serial killers who had totally fine childhoods. Right? It's that whole, like, nature versus nurture debate. Is someone born evil? Do they become evil due to their circumstances? Is it both? Either way, Louise's father certainly didn't help that situation. Louise would describe his father as an alcoholic womanizer who was abusive to not only his wife, but his children. He was incredibly strict, and he would never show any kindness to anyone in the family, really. His father even beat his mother violently when she was pregnant, and we mean heavily pregnant. It's also quite likely that Louise was sexually abused by at least one of his parents and possibly some of his younger siblings, as well as his mother's clients. And we mentioned already that his younger years were pretty rough. This is truly the story of an abused little boy turning into an absolute monster as an adult. And we really, really want to make it known that we don't want to use that as an excuse for what he did because it isn't. But 
Knowing where people like this come from helps us come closer to understanding how someone can do such evil things. I think you can have that sympathy for the child that they were without excusing the monster that they would grow up to be. Exactly, and this is a really good example of that. Uh, his father, he didn't really seem to like him very much. He only took him out into town when it was to have him work or to run errands. Luis's father also regularly referred to him as an imbecile or a bastard and a ton of other terrible things. He said later in interviews that his father, quote unquote, never had a good word for him. When he was around seven years old, his father strapped him to a tree and beat him with a branch because he tried to defend his mother from one of his father's many violent beatings. Oh, yikes. And, and this is just one occasion. It was constant abuse from this man. So, kind of goes without saying that his parents had a pretty horrific marriage. The household was filled with very little love and affection for one another, and there was constant fighting that led to violence on a pretty regular basis. We want to remind you that Louise was not the only child in this household either. Six other kids lived here too, and they were also subjected to this. Neither of his parents were very nurturing in any sense, and the kids often went neglected. It was not a happy place to grow up, and he doesn't really talk about having any happy memories. When kids grow up in an environment where they never feel safe and are basically in a fight or flight mentality for their formative years, it really fucks up their brains. Not to say everyone who has a traumatic upbringing will be a serial killer, but it sure doesn't help. No, and Luis and his siblings, they learned to fear their father very quickly, and eventually, whenever he would arrive home from work, the kids would all go into hiding, hoping that they wouldn't be the one their father would take as many frustrations on. Luis struggled a fair bit in school. He was shy and didn't speak up very often in class, but still appeared enthusiastic to learn despite the fact that he had a very difficult time understanding what they were trying to teach him. By his early elementary school years, he had begun to display some violent tendencies towards other children, but that didn't stop him from being a constant victim of bullying himself. They made fun of him for being shy and for not speaking up too often, as well as for a small size. They also teased him for wearing glasses. His last name, as you know, is Garavito, and the kids would call him Garabato, which translates to squiggle, which isn't nearly as adorable as it sounds. They would absolutely torment him. Kids are so mean. And I mean, this, on top of everything he was going through at home, really didn't make things better. And I think, as we all know, like, kids can be pretty relentless and, like, not even realize the effect that they're having on people. Oh my god, absolutely. And the worst thing about it is that the kids they weren't the only ones the teachers would never really try to stop the bullying at all which just kind of added to his anger and his resentment he was also subject to beatings from his teachers on a fairly regular basis but this was pretty normal at the time. I mean, that makes sense, because you said, I think he was born in 1957, That's right? right, yeah. Which is the same age as my dad, and my dad went to school when they were still, like, caning students. Oh, yeah. So, like, it's totally not out of the My ballpark. mom went to school in, in Bosnia back then, and, like, I know for a fact. Yeah. Like... Actually, I think both my parents and my grandparents at one point had all been to Catholic schools that were run by nuns. Oh, And so lovely. they had a pretty rough go of it, too. So, yeah, not... You know, school school was definitely different in the 50s and the 60s. It really was. You know, when you can still beat the kids, like, eesh. I feel like you can't even really tell them they're doing a bad job anymore. So no. So we've come, we've come far, haven't we? A long we? way, yeah. By the fifth grade, his father had told him that he was now forbidden from going to school and having friends or girlfriends. It was his job to work and earn money for the family, and this is what he was going to do now. Yep, he would have been around 11 at this time, and his dad was just like... You're grown now, kid. No more friends and fun for you. At 11 years old. Ugh, so that's like, what, grade kid. six? Like, jeez. Oh, I guess grade five for him. It isn't like he had much of a childhood to begin with, but after this, it was almost pretty much done as quickly as it began. This, along with the years and years of abuse that he had already endured from numerous people in his life, was already starting to build up into a ton of anger and resentment that would continue to grow and result in the deaths of hundreds of young boys. And folks, it's only getting worse from here on out. So he's 11 years old, he's forced to leave school, and he's constantly the subject of torment from most of those around him. It is a very rough start. Absolutely understatement of the year, isn't it? Oh, yeah. In interviews that he did after his capture, Louise would say that he had his first sexual experience around the age of 12, and that it was around that time that he was brutally sexually assaulted and tormented by the owner of a drugstore that him and his father would regularly frequent. The owner of the store was a neighbor of theirs, and they would go there pretty often. One day, his father took him to the drugstore for Louise to receive some vaccinations. Allegedly, the man tied him up to a bed, 
burned him with a candle, cut him with razor blades, and bit him violently all while assaulting him. Oh my god. Just, oh my god. According to Luis Garavito, these assaults from the drugstore owner took place multiple times and his father was aware of it. Shortly after this, Luis did something that many serial killers are known to do during their adolescent years. He began to hurt animals. Luis killed two birds by throwing rocks at them and then dissected the bodies. He admitted that he felt shame and remorse after this, but his behavior would just continue to escalate. He often shared a bed with his siblings and sometimes his parents. It was around this time that he began to regularly sexually abuse his younger siblings while they were in bed together. He stated that his parents knew all about this, but that they didn't do anything to stop it. It was around this time that he also began to abuse a young neighbor of his. At this point, he's developed a reputation as an incredibly withdrawn and distant child who showed little emotion or compassion. He was known for his aggression and for having an attitude that was described as ready to take revenge on the world. The family eventually relocated to another town, which meant the abuse that he was suffering from the neighbor and others in the area stopped, but it didn't matter. By this point, Luis was only 14 years old, but he had both suffered and caused a lot of trauma. He began to experience issues with erectile dysfunction around this time, and this is a problem that would continue on into adulthood. This is also around the time that he began to realize that he was more attracted to boys than he was to girls. It was also around this time that he had his first experience with pornography. Apparently, it was some heterosexual porn that a neighbor that was a friend of the family showed him. He expressed disgust at what he saw, which led to the neighbor promptly beating him and sexually assaulting him. What the hell? I don't, like, how like, does we that were... make any, any sense? Why like, won't somebody think of the children? I, it, it's crazy to me that, like, I don't, I don't want to call it fate, because I, I hate to believe that a higher power would ever do this to an individual, but it's like every single person along his journey up to 14 years old at this point, every single one of them has been shit. There has not been a shining light in the darkness for this kid. No, not one. And the interesting thing is it's, it's as if every single person that he comes across throughout his life from the very beginning is either someone who is going to abuse him or be abused by him. Yeah, there's no... There's nothing else. No. While all of Garavito's victims would be male, he did try to have relationships with women throughout his life. Around this time, he attempted to meet girls and go on dates, but his advances were always rejected. Alcoholism was pretty rampant in Luis's family, as well as those that they surrounded themselves with. Eventually, Luis started to drink too. And we're not going to pretend like there aren't quite a few folks out there who had their first drink before they were legally allowed to. Hello, we live in Canada. (laughs) But Luis had such an abundant amount of alcohol around him, as well as what we can clearly see is poor impulse control. Considering some of the things he's already done to others, it didn't take long until he was a full-blown teenage alcoholic. And surprise, surprise, the alcohol didn't exactly make him into a better version of himself. It did quite the opposite. Luis was an angry drunk, and he would quickly get violent. His parents would punish him and kick him out numerous times throughout his teens for his behavior while he was under the influence of large amounts of alcohol. His mother once kicked him out of the house after he attempted to sexually assault a five-year-old boy. Honestly, it seems like his parents would look past a lot of stuff, and even though they weren't exactly, like, the greatest, it's good to see that they were finally like, hey, Luis, this can't happen. But it's pretty ridiculous that they looked past all of the things that he did and it took them this long before they reacted to what he was doing. Less than a year later, he was caught trying to assault another child. This time, a six-year-old boy that he had met at a train station in Bogota. Luckily, the boy screamed and alerted the authorities that were nearby. Luis was arrested for this and when he was interrogated, he said, and I'm not making this up, this is true, He was only trying to lightly molest the boy. Like, how is that anybody's re- What? What? Like, yeah, this- Bleh. I Like, what? (laughs) Oh, sorry, officer. I was only lightly going to molest him. Just lightly. Like, just a little. Like, what the fuck? Dude. We're seeing very quickly here that he doesn't have any remorse for the things he's doing. He sees people as someone to use. He just wanted all of this with zero consequences. His father grew to resent him even more after all of this happened. His homosexuality was a constant source of tension in the house, and this is what would eventually cause him to leave home for good. Now, some accounts say that he ran away to escape the abuse from his father, but others say that he was kicked out due to the terrible things that he was doing to his siblings and to other children in the area. I can definitely see 
seeing it being more of a combination of the two. I mean, really what was keeping him there at all. Exactly. And I mean, he had been out of school for like five years at oh, this right. point at 16 yeah. because his dad was making him work. So he probably felt like he was ready to be out in the world and on his own. Being out in the world was a terrible thing for the world indeed. So at this point, he is 16. He is a walking, talking, abusive, red flag of a human being who is willing to hurt anyone that he wants to with absolutely no remorse for his actions. And now he has no one looking after him or telling him what to do. He can basically start doing anything he wants. Things are already bad and they're about to get a hell of a lot worse. It really is like the worst thing that he could have done. I mean, it isn't like his home life was good and he was regularly hurting a lot of people, but he quickly escalated after he moved out. And it wasn't like he had a group of friends or like really any positive positive influences anywhere. He was a loner throughout his life and for the most part he had issues forming bonds with anyone. He actually eventually started working as a corporate assistant and he even studied marketing for a little bit. It seems as if this was a pretty good job for him for a little bit but he had constant problems with his co-workers and his clients and surprise surprise these problems would often lead to violent altercations. So this eventually led to him losing his job. So then he got into the business of street vending. He'd sell, sell religious icons, prayer cards, and ornaments. He held various jobs and eventually began working at a coffee farm. It was there that he met and fell in love with um, a single mother named Luz Mary Ocampo Orozco. She was a teacher and the two would often attend prayer services together. Surprise, surprise, the relationship did not last. And you know what, it's pretty gross, but he actually kind of ended up becoming like friends, if you could call it that, with a few local women who had young kids. A lot of them actually reported him as being a pretty nice guy when he was sober and someone who would treat their kids as if they were his own children. I wonder if this was like some kind of attempt to like kind of, I don't know, treat kids, like kind of like we were saying before how like when you're bullied or you're traumatized, you kind of have the two choices. You either also become a bully or you don't do that again. I wonder if it was his, like, weird way of trying to, like, help. One of the things that's interesting about him is, like, he very quickly, I think, figured out there's certain kids that he could hurt without right. getting in trouble, but there were other kids that were off limits to him. And I think he knew when he had to do either of those things. Because guys like this, they're manipulative, they're two-faced, they know how to put on that, like, mask. And we see that from him later because people knew him as, like, a helpful man. But, like, he knows, okay, these kids I can hurt, but if I hurt these kids, I'm going to lose my lady friends and it's going to be bad. I, yeah, you're right. I feel like it's probably more that than any kind of weird redemption story. Like he's just a gross dude. He had a few friends, or at least as close to what you could call friends, and they all knew him as a pretty nice guy, like we said, someone that you wanted to avoid, though, when he was drinking. If he wasn't getting violent while he was drunk, he would just be talking about violence. He talked numerous times about finally getting revenge on his father for all the pain and suffering he had put him through, and he told no numerous people that he wanted to kill him. So don't be fooled, though. It wasn't as if Luis Garavito was somehow some dream boyfriend and nice guy that you just didn't want to be around while he was drinking. This guy was still an asshole to those around him. He had anger problems, which we already know, but he also had a huge issue with jealousy. He was an extremely controlling partner and his relationships would often involve a ton of fighting and physical abuse. And if you thought his younger years were bad, that's the only the beginning. By now, Luis was a grown man. His alcoholism is at an all-time high, and he regularly drank to cope with the trauma from his childhood. By now, he had cut off contact with the majority of his family members. He wanted nothing to do with most of them, especially his father. He did stay in touch with one of his sisters, though, but she wasn't exactly, like, a big fan of his at all. She would actually go out of her way to avoid him. Due to his childhood, he had, obviously, a lot of mental health issues. He drank because he was extremely depressed. He was incredibly angry. And the horrifying thing is that he's still quite young at this point. Everything we've talked about so far happened before he would start killing. But just because he wasn't killing doesn't mean that he wasn't out there doing terribly evil things to countless victims. Between the 1970s to the 1980s, Luis Garavito would sexually assault countless children, 
At this point, his victims were both young boys and some young girls, but he had a preference towards the boys. He'd try to push himself towards female partners, but he would struggle to get an erection. And by this point, when he was having sex with women, or at least trying to, he couldn't do it sober. There isn't a ton known about his life during his 20s, and honestly, we've talked about enough terrible things, and I'm pretty sure we can all kind of guess and we fill in the blanks. We can piece it together, yeah. Yeah. Honestly, like, what we do know was that he was basically just drinking regularly and constantly sexually assaulting countless people. Eventually, he decided that he wanted to improve his life and deal with his past traumas, which, you know, you'd good. Think, Great, yeah, okay. awesome. Good, yeah, okay, good. He actually joined uh, Alcoholics Anonymous in 78 in an effort to quit drinking. He got together with Lou's Mary, once again his former girlfriend, for a little bit during this time. The two attended church together once again, and for a time things seemed to be going pretty okay. He converted to the Pentecostal faith at this time, and he had a steady job too. They eventually relocated to another town where Louise got a job helping out at a bakery. And you know what? Like, I, I love my baked oh, goods. Yeah, I love I'm a to car eat. Yeah, bitch. Yeah, but yeah. like, <laughs> I would not want to eat anything that was even in the no. same room as this man. This is like Jeffrey Dahmer working in the chocolate factory. Yes, like, exactly. No, like, thank I just you. picture, like, I love bread, but I don't know. No, not that you. much. Mm-hmm. I would go gluten free if I knew Louise was working there. Gluten free for Louise. <laughs> But with all good things, they must come to an end. Louise just couldn't control his damn temper, and he was eventually fired for fighting with a coworker. I get it? Like, come on, man. Louise, you were doing so it. good. This pushed him over the edge. This was the first time in his life that things seemed to be going somewhat well for him, and it should come as no surprise that he didn't handle this very well at all. Shortly after this, he made an attempt on his life, and honestly, full offense to this dude, but if he had succeeded, then he wouldn't have been able to kill hundreds of poor little kids. This is why I have a hard time believing in fate, because, Mm -hmm. like, mm, this guy just shouldn't have been born. Totally. He did check himself into a hospital and spent the majority of the early part of 1980 there. During this time, he continued to struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts. The depression was the main thing that they focused on, too. It doesn't really seem like they really touched the whole, like, horrific anger and desire to hurt everyone thing at all. And this is something I just want everyone to really know. After he was caught, he expressed a ton of remorse, and he had a bunch of reasons for why he did what he did, but the majority of his issues seemed to be because of how he felt because of what had happened to him, not because of how he felt due to what he was doing. So when he tried to to take his own life, it wasn't even because of what he did to hurt other people. He was upset because of how things were going for him. Ugh. Man. Like, that says it all right there. It really does. He actually didn't even want to talk to the hospital staff that were treating him about the fact that he had sexually assaulted countless children at this point. He also didn't talk about the fact that he was more interested in men rather than women. The staff had no clue about his real issues. And, like, if you're not honest with your therapist, guys, they can't help you. Exactly. And this is another really good example of him putting up that, like, facade of, I'm just a hurt man, right? Yeah, I'm just sad. Yeah, I'm just sad. That's all. It was noted that he did try to tell his psychologist that he wanted to have children, but when they asked him to elaborate, he lied, and he said that he meant that he wanted to start a family. So he straight up was like, my problem is I want to have kids, and the therapist was like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I I want to have kids, like, I want to have family. Yeah, I want to get married and have children, not I want to have children. Oh, vile. Hate you. When he was released, he would continue to go to his AA meetings and was heavily involved with his church. But despite all of this, he would still often end most of his days by visiting parks that were known to have sex workers, many of them unwilling, underage children. And I hate this dude so much. Oh, he's rancid. Oh my god, like you guys, he hasn't even killed anyone yet. Like, think about all the terrible things that we've talked about when it comes to this monster, and remember, he hasn't even started the worst of the worst. This is a lot. This is heavy, and it's terrible, but it's nothing compared to what is to come. Luis Garavito is rotten to his very core. Make no mistake about that. No. Next week, we're going to get into what Luis Garavito got up to in the 1980s and his continued escalation. 
We're also going to talk about his relationship with religion and Satanism, as well as the things he was doing to cope with the crimes that he already committed. And we're going to start getting into his horrific murder spree that lasted nine full years. This story is going to take some incredibly dark twists and turns, including what Luis Garavito says happened to him when he used a Ouija board. So sorry guys, this was a rough one. And we have talked about a lot of the terrible things, but like we said before, we haven't even gotten to the murder part yet. Uh, Right? Like, we really are just at the beginning of a very horrifying story, so like, (laughs) Like we did say in the beginning, um, it's probably going to be a two-part series, maybe even three, because there is a ton of information we found out about him that we do want to cover. And it's fascinating. It really is. You sure do, like, you go down the rabbit hole. Um, Like a lot of our stories, it doesn't end after the murders, because there is a chance that he will be released next year. And we're going to talk about that a lot and also explain why his sentence was the way that it was. So there's a ton to go over here. It's going to be a wild ride, that's for sure. And don't forget, we are still accepting our paranormal experience stories for a future episode. Please send us in your submissions. We're really enjoying reading them. And remember to make your subject line the ghost with the most. Email them to us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you guys. And if you have suggestions for future episodes, especially our upcoming palette cleanser, please let us know. As always, make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. And we're on Facebook now. Oh, yeah. We yeah, sure are. We so. have a Facebook page yeah, now. Yeah, we, um, same thing though, Grim Curriculum, so you can search us in the yeah. search bar. We should come up. So, yeah, feel free to give us a follow. We figured there was a bit of an audience there that we were missing out on, yeah. and we didn't want you guys to miss out on anything. So, invite your mom and your aunt to like our our podcast they'll, yeah. they'll just love it they'll love it and you can also find us on social media i am dina v on twitch dina v i g on instagram and dina v tweets on twitter and i'm ominous underscore walrus on twitter and ominous walrus on instagram join us every saturday for a new episode and we also do a live premiere on youtube at 12 p.m mst so come hang out with us and discuss the case in real time thanks as always for listening you guys this has been the, the grim, grim curriculum, curriculum.